Thank you for joining us. My name is Barry Erickson, and I'm Community Engagement Coordinator at Wheaton Public Library. Tonight, we are delighted to bring you another art demonstration in partnership with the DuPage Art League. Founded over 60 years ago, the DuPage Art League is dedicated to promoting and encouraging the visual arts through classes, workshops, gallery exhibits, and public programs such as this one. We are grateful to the DuPage Art League for arranging tonight's demonstration by acclaimed artist Mary Ann Terzna. Mary Ann graduated from the University of Illinois, Chicago with a BA in Studio Arts. She worked as a freelance graphic designer for over 15 years also pursuing her personal work in the fine arts. Most of her current work is landscape and still life paintings in pastel or oil. Marianne is a signature member of the Chicago Pastel Painters. And she's joining us from her Union Street Gallery in Chicago Heights. It is a third floor space that she shares with artists Mary Kay Peter Whitlock and Jean Lewis. Visitors are welcome. In fact, the three of them are having a studio open house on May 14th, and I think we're all invited. <laughs> so with that, uh, I'll turn everything over to you, Mary Ann. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you, Barry. Thank you for this opportunity. And I'd like to welcome everybody to my studio space. Um, now I'm freezing here because I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do from <laughs> going forward. Uh, I'm going to be working on a still life. Uh, things are a little bit different than I usually do it. Uh, generally, I have the still life, uh, usually fruits and vegetables um, on interesting fabric set up right here on the table next to my easel. Um, for lighting issues and because I wanted to test stuff beforehand, I actually working from a photograph. I will work from photographs from some of my landscapes, but the still life has almost always started with the live material. And um, I will take a reference photo because sometimes the painting takes longer than the fruit lasts. But like I said, usually I start from what's here. Um, I'm going to, uh, I guess I'm going to go ahead and switch and just start with the painting. Oh, I'll start a little bit about what I'm working on. Uh, I am working on a um, UART uh, sanded paper. Anybody who watched Mike's demo last month, he's working on a sanded paper also. It's a very common surface for pastel artists because it holds a lot of tooth. Um, and sanded paper, just like it sounds, it's, it's, it's very similar to what you would go to and buy at Home Depot. It even comes in different grits. The um, difference is, is that the stuff they make for artists is archival and um, designed for painting. Uh, the UART I'm working on will use uh, wet medium, and that's going to be part of the demonstration that I'm going to do today. So at this point, I am gonna switch from my laptop to the phone and uh, that should be focusing on the uh, paper. Give me a second while I mute everything. And unmute. Okay, Marianne, yes, the, uh, your phone is spotlighted. So everyone is uh. looking at your easel. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Excellent. All right, so this is sanded paper. Now, as I said, if you watched Mike last uh, um, month, he had his painting mounted on a board. I think he uses foam core, which I do too. I, use, um, I sometimes use archival foam core and a double-sided adhesive to mount the paper on there. That is not what I've got here. This is a little bit different. Uh, it's another way I like to work. And I've actually stapled the paper. I wet it first. And this is very similar to the way you would stretch a canvas. Is uh, I wet the paper both sides. And then I staple going to alternate sides as I pull it a little bit. Once it, I staple it down and it dries, it gives a nice taunt, sturdy surface. I've stapled it on, this is just an industrial material called homosote. And it's, um, I think it's soundproofing. You can buy it at um, Menards or Home Depot or something like that. And it's nice because you can staple it, pull the staples out, reuse it again, even sand it if it gets too rough. It's also very good for the wet medium. The other thing is, is that since I haven't mounted this yet on a foam core, 
I have a little bit of flexibility if I decide to go a little bit larger, a little bit smaller. Um, I, in fact, I, I did that earlier. I was gonna go a 14 inch square and I decided to go a little smaller with a 12 inch square. Now uh, you can see I have my reference photo here. As I said, normally there would actually be the fruit on the side. The other thing I have here are thumbnails. Um, I used to not do any much, much um, studying before I just jumped into a picture. I would look at what I was doing, frame it with a viewfinder and decide that's it. I have found that if I spend a little time on creating thumbnails, I make compositional decisions earlier on and I make better decisions. Now there's um, three versions of the thumbnail. I actually drew it a couple of times before I decided on this composition. This is just looking at the line. This is looking at values. Values is very important and I'm gonna be talking about that as I'm working. Value is very important in um, creating a painting um, especially with pastels. Um, so I looked at that, the darkest, oh, by values, I mean the dark and the light in, um, in a picture, in my subject. So I need to know where my darkest areas are, where my lightest areas, where my midtones are. And I'm gonna be looking at that constantly. That's gonna drive the, um, my color selection, my pastel selection. And something I try to be aware of when I'm when I'm working the whole time. And a lot of that too is that I am very interested in light. Light and color, uh, especially with my still life, is, is what I am I am painting. I'm not as concerned about grapes or oranges as I am about red and orange and light and shadow. Now this third thumbnail here is something called a no tan. So what I did is, um, this is just pencil. Sometimes I use three markers so that I have two grays. And I'm sorry, could I interrupt you for just a second? Would it be possible for you to move that sketch just a little bit closer to the camera for us? The sketching? Yes. Ah, uh, yes. Oh, so much better. Thank you. Oh, okay. So... This is the values, this is the line drawing, this is the no tan. And basically what I did is I reduced the values in this first one to simply black and white. And again, it's just another way to evaluate your composition and to, to study your subject before you jump into the pastels. And again, I, I will be aware of the darks and lights as I'm choosing my, my colors. Now I have one other thing, I put it up here because it's such a common tool, uh, especially when I'm doing um, uh, landscapes. Uh, I sometimes do plain air. So I will be outside looking at the subject and framing out. And when you plain, paint plain air, you have, you have a whole landscape. Everything is in front of you. You need to cut it down. You need to reduce it and decide what you're painting. And I use this tool a lot. It opens to different dimensions. So for instance, if I was going for a, a nine by 12 drawing, this would be the appropriate dimensions. In this case, um, I'm doing a square composition. So when I was planning out my, my fruits, my layout, I use this to, to frame it before I even did those thumbnails. So I will sometimes take an hour or two to play with what subjects I have for my still lifes and I continuously view it through the viewfinder. And in some cases I use the viewfinder to decide whether I wanna do a horizontal, a vertical or a square composition. So um, as I said, I started, I decided to do a square composition with this. Um, I do like doing a square composition. It's kind of a fun challenge. A square is a very stable um, shape and my goal is to add um, a dynamic quality to the stable shape. So the first thing I did is, oh, and I should step back and say on the sanded paper, this is just vine charcoal. I did a very um, brief initial sketch. I laid out 
the broad shapes of what I'm gonna be painting. And the other thing I did is there are tick marks midpoint on each of these lines that I use here too. And I'll use, I use that as I'm placing the object on there. So I have this nice fun di uh, diagonal that I introduced by using the fabric. I've got another diagonal going down here that I introduced by the, the grape stem and the grapes across there. And I just made another stable, interesting X composition right to the middle. So our whole challenge is gonna be to use light and color and shape to move your eye around there and keep this from being a static, uninteresting painting. So um, uh, I'm left-handed, but uh, and normally my, my you know, pastels would be on my left side, but again, the camera's on the left side. So I've got a tray over here with my pastels. And when we do this studio tour, I'll kind of show you the, the setup a little bit more. But I have a huge number of pastels over here to my right, and I will pull from those and bring them to this tray so that uh, I, I'm not suddenly choosing from hundreds of pastels. I have a limited number here. I will be regularly walking over there and getting new ones. We're going to start with um, a brand that I like. They're, they're called Terry Ludwig. And I use these for my initial layouts in part because they have extraordinarily rich dark colors in this brand. The, the, the colors are wonderful. I, I, not, I don't like the texture as much and I'll talk about the other brands that I use. But the first thing I'm gonna grab is something to start out doing these lovely shadows. And this is it's actually a purple. Now, we've got all individual grapes, but when I start here, I am not gonna be worrying too much about the individual ones as much as I am about the values of colors of the larger shapes. I'm using the side of the pastel in a lot of cases here. I'm looking at the fact that they're darkening as they get away from the light. I had a spotlight on this that was to the top right. And I deliberately like to make a um, heavy shadow light and shadow play. Because as I said, that's, that's one of the things I'm fascinated by when I'm drawing these. And I am concentrating more on the darks than the lights. With pastels, it is easier to go from dark to light to cover a darker pastel with a lighter. It is much harder to um, do the opposite, to go from light to dark. And again, I'm staying with these Terry Ludwigs. I know it's a lemon. This is green, but dark yellow is kind of greenish. We will, the, the, the finished pastel will have many layers to it. Um, I don't know how far we'll get today. Marianne, you said that brand was Terry Ludwig? Yeah, L-U-D-W-I-G. Great, thank you. Now the cloth back here was actually black. Um, this is, I actually have the, the fabrics here. The lovely scarf. And another lovely scarf. 
with patterns. I will tell you, I start with a real subject. Um, this is a black, like I said, it's black. Maybe it's a really dark blue. I'm not sure which it is. Um, I often shift the colors just to make something interesting with the painting. And the other thing is, is it's a black scarf and you will never find me touching a black pastel. Um, by layering multiple colors, you create a black that's much more interesting. So again, I'm looking at the darker areas. It's darker down here. Now this that I just picked up, this is a, uh, a Rembrandt. Uh, majority of my pastels are Rembrandts. Rembrandt is a good, um, it's, so these are all soft pastels, but some are referred to as hard soft pastels. The, the Rembrandt is a little bit harder. That means that um, I don't have, that, that uh, it doesn't leave a real thick layer of pastel if I keep a light mark. Some brands, if you put even just a light mark, you leave a lot of pastel down. So I'm gonna start um, with purples. Let's see what I got here. Or my black. looking at the folds and the way the light shifts across. This is actually a, um, I'm not sure what this is. So one of the first things I do when I start pulling out the pastels is I peel the label off and snap them in pieces so that I can use the side like I'm doing now. The downside to that is that I don't know what color this is. Although I can find out because my studio partner, Mary Kay, does not peel the labels off of her pastels. So I walk over to her box and do a little mix and match. And usually I'm able to figure out from there. So that's convenient. I'm gonna put a little more darks in here. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take the, um, the painting that I've got here and I am going to spray it with isopropyl alcohol and brush the pastel down into the paper. And this will give me a really good foundation. It pulls the pastel that I've just applied into the tooth of the paper and it leaves a lot of tooth for me to continue working. It gives me a um, underpainting that is ready to start getting a lot more layers. And I love this technique because it quickly gets me past that, that whole uh, big blank white canvas sort of fear. And it's also one I use for my landscapes. Um, I use the isopropyl alcohol in underpainting. I also have another technique where I use a watercolor underpainting. Now, if I was doing a landscape, I will sometimes do the alcohol wash and the brushing upright because uh, the drips and random marks are good for that. I don't like to do that as well for the um, still lifes. So you're gonna have to bear with me because I'm gonna take this down, put it on the table, and I'm gonna turn the camera around here. Let 
there's a thumbtack, thumbtack somewhere on my floor that I'll probably find with my shoe eventually. Okay, Marianne, so I switched uh, the spotlight to your laptop camera. Oh no, keep it on the, the phone. I'm just turning the, the, I have to turn the phone. Oh, okay, no problem. Yes, but that's okay. It keeps people from getting dizzy while I'm doing this. All right, so we got some weird shadow stuff going on. This is not a perfect situation. Um, when, when I first talked about doing this, the uh, lighting in our studio is great for the display on, that we've got on the walls. And we all tend to work with um, spots on our on our work. Uh, okay, well, we'll just, you'll get the idea here. So isopropyl alcohol, buy that from all greens in the spray bottle. I'm gonna move my reference photo out of the way a little bit. I have a whole bunch of, these are pretty cheap brushes. So um, it is, a. Not, I think a nylon brush and some kind of artificial soft material. I've got a couple of different sizes of these. Uh, they're inexpensive brushes because I'm working on sanded paper and they won't last long uh, if it was a fine brush that I had to worry about keeping an edge to it. While I'm here, I might as well also show that uh, I have some very stiff bristle brushes in various shapes. And these are erasers. You can use that to take down, um, well, a mistake. If you've got too many layers and you go, I don't like what I've done, you can brush down. It still has the stain on the paper. You don't get back to white paper, but you do get back to a very workable surface using those. So I am going to take the smaller of these and I'm going to start with the lighter colors. And you see, I just sprayed a little alcohol in there. Now I am trying to keep in mind the original shapes that I had here, but I am not um, worried about anything exact. This is an underpainting. It's just mostly gonna all get covered. Now I keep a, uh, a rag that is, let's see here, um, tucked in my pocket because I'm constantly wiping the brushes. And if I don't have a rag there, then it's my jeans that get pastel all over them. Marianne, if, we, if I can ask, um, can you use just any pastel paper and it will stand up to that alcohol or, or water? That's a very good question. And the answer is no. Um, some brands, and they will usually tell you right there where, where you purchase. If you, you know, if you go to Blick or wherever you're buying your papers at, um, they have to be able to tolerate wet medium. I've, I've also found some that they tolerated wet medium, but the alcohol seemed to deteriorate the, the, the adhesive a little bit more. So this, so I use the UART plus, it does need to be either um, stretched like I've got here or fastened down somehow because the wet media will buckle the paper. Right. And that's why I like this, this where it's fastened to the... Um, yeah, can you remind us the name of that um, substrate or that board that it's attached to? Oh, uh, home of soak, I, I think it's spelled H O M A S O T E, um, or alternatively, you can. I've mounted them on um, archival foam core. Now, if I'm doing a, a landscape with, for instance, a lot of grasses or something like that, um, and I'm doing this, this technique, um, I'll use a uh, textured bristle brush. 
think I have one here. Oh my, the uh, fan brush. And that, that introduces kind of fun textures to your, uh, parts are falling off my brush here. So we are gonna need to let this dry for a few minutes. I'm gonna move it over to a fan I've got down on the floor. And then I'll come back and get the iPhone and we'll do a little tour of the studio while we wait for paint to dry. It would be a lot more interesting than watching paint dry. All right. Man, just one question about the process that you just went through. Um, do sure. you wipe your brushes uh, so that the dark colors don't muddy the light colors? Was that part of the process? Yes, that's that's why uh, um, um, like I said, I, ha I have a rag here that, that I just continuously um, had tucked in my pocket. So I kept wiping the brush on this. I don't worry about it too much. And it also helps if you try to go from the lighter colors to the darker ones. Great, thank you. Yeah, let's go ahead with that tour. Okay, so this is the painting with the fan down now, drying up quickly, I hope. That's the nice thing about the, the uh, alcohol. You can do this with water. I think the alcohol dissolves the um, pigment better. Uh, pulls it into the, the paper better, but also it dries significantly faster than if we did it with water. <coughs> um, uh, on the uh, walls, I have all kinds of finished work um, on display. I, I do do a little abstract. You see some of those up there. Um, still lifes and landscapes. Uh, we are on the third floor. In fact, we had a discussion when we were talking about planning this because these windows, these wonderful huge windows face due west. So if it was sunny today, we would have had a problem because it comes straight through here. We do have blinds, they're semi-transparent blinds, but we still sometimes get a pretty strong light through here. Um, as you can see, I have very talented granddaughters that come and visit me. Uh, I do some of the work sitting down, so I have a drawing table for that. Every studio requires a thinking chair. It's where I stare at it and wonder if it's gonna be finished, if it's finished or not. Now, this is Mary Kay's uh, work. Mary Kay also works in pastel. She does mostly landscapes. This is Mary Kay's selection of pastels. Now that's what I forgot to do. I meant to show you that this is what I'm choosing from. As you can see, the studio box has a lot of brands in it. Uh, this is a, a mix of Rembrandt, Schmicki, which is a lovely, real soft, described as a buttery feeling to it. A few Richeson, and um, some of the Terry Ludwig are in here. So that's why I said I select from the box here and it goes onto the tray here so that when I'm reaching for a red, I know that this is the red I've already used. <coughs> and uh, that's the card. Then there's a few extra pastels at the bottom of that too, because again, you never have too many pastels. And each of us arrange our boxes a little bit differently. That's our joke, Mary Kay does not break quarters or peel the labels off, which works out for me. She tends to work at the drawing table. Um, this is Jean's space. Jean just moved in a, a few months ago. Um, Jean does a lot of portrait work. And you can see that she's got a collection of and pencils. Well, I don't think she uses them a real lot in her work. I think mostly for edges. And uh, this is another type of pastel called New Pastel. I do use those too. They're uh, thinner, harder sticks. Uh, Terry Ludwig um, and Rembrandt's. And 
the same thing. She's got hers organized by um, hue, the color, red, green, blue, purple, and value. So dark to light. And I have the same thing in my box. And Jean also has a thinking chair. This uh, studio is located in Union Street Gallery. Uh, we're on the third floor. As you can see, we have more studios going down this way. There is a um, exhibit space on the main floor and the second floor mezzanine. Uh, 13 studios all together in this space. So it looks like the surface is just about dry. I'm going to set this down for a second while I raise everything back up again. If you do this technique, an easy way to tell if the surface is dry is if you touch it. And um, if it's cool, it's still drying. Let me adjust this just a little bit. And get my reference photo back. Are there any questions so far? Uh, we're just confirming that it's homosote, H-O-M-A-S-O-T-E, that you're working with. Um, other than yeah, that, that's that's this board. Yes, yes. But, but anything that, that you, you know, the other way is just to tape it down on um, a drawing board or something like that. I like this because of the stapling. This is something that Mary Kay taught me. And, and you can really, it really holds the paper well. You can apl apply a lot of different media to it. Great. I think that is all the questions for now. So whenever you're ready to keep going. Thank you so much for the tour of the gallery that was, or the studio, that was wonderful. It's a great space. Um, we do have uh, open calls sometimes. We have shows that change up every month or so. So uh, if you're at all in the area, please get on our mailing list to uh, stop by and check it out. UnionStreetGallery.org, I believe is the website. And I'm just, so you can see there's very little that's, that's real. I mean, a pastel comes up if you, uh, if you touch it, of course, and uh, pastel is, it's, it's always like that. I've, I've heard people, you know, afraid that it's a fragile media. It is not. Um, it is always loose dust, but once you put that under glass, then it is a completely permanent, wonderful media. The nice thing about pastels is that it is pure pigment. So I don't think you can get color any more brilliant than you can get when you're working with pastels. I'm just cleaning up some of the edges here with my fingers. I don't do too much in the early stages. I, um, I'll do the, in the later stages, I try not to do too much of uh, rubbing with my fingers that tends to um, kind of just swoosh the colors together, reduce the, the layer, the, 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 the look of the layers. But it's already started, I'll, I'll just move it down a little bit. Um, when I first started working on the sanded paper, I did that a lot more. And especially the, the first time or two, I used the sanded paper and I used a coarse tooth. Uh, two days later, I was wondering why my fingertips were sore. I felt like I was trying to remember if I had accidentally burned myself or something. I finally realized that I had rubbed um, my fingers a little bit wrong on the sanded paper. Cautionary notes. Uh, 
All right, so now we are going to start on Trying to grab a red that isn't too bright too early. Again, I'm going to walk over here and get something else. These are mostly Rembrandts that I'm using right now. One of the things I have to remind myself is what's behind and what's in front of, and not to lose that in the initial layouts. I also want to remember where my light's at. It's a good idea to make sure that you're working all around the picture. That you're using the colors throughout. You don't want to have, um, say, a particular red only in one area. You want to make sure you're moving around with your colors. You also want to build the background along with the foreground so that you don't end up with yourself having an absolutely perfect set of grapes and then need to try to draw the background around them. That uh, gets too frustrating. So you want to build the image together. So as I said, I picked a purple for the fabric. It's black fabric, but this is um, a warmer color that, that approaches a dark yellow almost. And I'm doing that intentionally to sort of neutralize the purple. So I can kind of continue to have a fabric that looks like it might be defined as black, even though I'm not using 
a black. Although we'll see in the end, I might decide that I want it to be a different color. I've done that often enough. Now you'll notice it's a pattern fabric and I am not drawing the pattern. That is not gonna happen until much further on in the drawing. If um, what I'm doing right now is establishing the shape of the fabric, and the distribution of the light. Just getting enough layers on this. Notice I can define a shape by drawing what's around it. So those grapes can be defined by these little marks. That aren't grape as much as um, by using the reds. Sometimes you put a color on there and you go, that's not a color I want. I don't like that. I always err on the side of too, too bright, too vivid, because it's very easy to tone down a color. Um, a lot harder to make a dull color more interesting once you've gotten a few layers on there. Also, I think us pastel artists tend to really like bright color. I wanted to tone or darken the blue, I grabbed something in the orange family. See that immediately kind of takes down the intensity of that blue and can even add a little bit of dark to it. I pay a little bit more attention now to, to the individual grapes. I usually keep, you know, I have the, the initial sketch was with a piece of charcoal. I usually keep that around. Every so often I want to reinforce my shape and what I'm doing here. I want to remind myself that I've got that lovely grape stem going through here. And again, with a lot of what I'm doing, I am not um, overly concerned with accurately and completely reproducing what I've got here. There are lines, colors, and decisions I make that are based as much on what I am looking at in front of me as far as the painting instead of the reference photo. If um, I'm using a reference photo, whether it's a still life or landscape, there is a point when the photo pretty much gets put away and I try to just look at the painting and decide what the painting needs. It's so quiet over there, Barry. Are there still people around? A absolutely. Uh, we did have a couple <laughs> of, of questions in, in response to that wonderful tour of, of your gallery and, and studio space. Uh, just to confirm, the date of the open house is May 14th. Is that correct? Okay. 
Wait one second. I'm going to grab a card to make sure. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to make that mistake. <laughs> there we go. Oops, get my thumb off of it. May 14th. Great, great. Thank you. And uh, someone else is asking, uh, do you teach classes, particularly at the gallery or somewhere else? I don't teach classes here. I am doing a um, pastel class at McCord Gallery in Palis Park. Um, and in fact, the next session starts Wednesday. So there's still time to sign up if anybody is interested. And it is a, um, basically it's, it's for um, beginner, complete newbie on up to, to mid-level, mid mid-range uh, um, pastel artists. Uh, I show a little bit of this technique and the watercolor technique. Uh, what I generally do is I set up a landscape. If people don't have a subject they wanna do, they can work from, I'm sorry, set up a still life, not a landscape. They set up a still life and uh, they can work from that or they can bring their own reference materials and work from there. And I work with them. We do, uh, uh, we work, it's two hour classes uh, on Wednesdays um, from uh, 9.30 to 11.30. Uh, we work in class and then we take some time to walk around and look at everybody's work. It's uh, really nice because there's a mix of students and subject matter and a lot of, lot of good discussions in that. So if anybody is interested, it's, it's Payless uh, McCord and uh, you can sign up at their website, which uh, I believe, can you send links, Barry? Uh, I, I can put them in the chat, for instance. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think at the end of this, didn't you have links? Yes, yeah. Because I believe I provided McCord Gallery's link. Oh, okay. Yeah. Otherwise, a search for McCord Gallery in Payless Park would would, uh, would get you there. Yes, I, I have that link. I just checked in my notes. And so I'll be sending that out in the email uh, following tonight's program. Thank you. An important thing that, um, you know, it's when you bring up teaching, it's one of the big things I stress when I'm teaching is that you can't spend your whole time right here in front of the, the, the painting. You need to step back continuously and evaluate what you're doing from a little bit of a distance because it looks very different when you back away. I need a different color for the blue shadows. I'm gonna scroll over here and see what I can come up with. That's too much. That's right. Regularly talking to yourself is an important part of making art. I'm going to say that. Again, I'm just building, building up layers. It, it, uh... It's 
Sometimes I use the side. A lot of times I uh, work with the pastel. I don't know. Let's see if we can see that to the point where I get an edge to it. Just a little bit of a slope at the end. And that gives me a sharp point when I need an, need an edge. And then the rest of the time I have a smaller flat surface to work with. Without thinking, I went and put the wrong color under this shadow, but that's all right. This layers. The nice thing about the red grapes is they have such a range of colors in them. Purples, reds, and oranges. And if you get a, a, a light behind them, you can get almost a almost a glow through the uh, through the fruit. When I go to the grocery store, I probably look like the fussiest fruit shopper out there. And actually all I'm doing is walking around evaluating things for color. I went to a farm stand once. I was buying peaches and I was really picking through it. And the, and the nice man, he, he knows us because we go there often enough. And he comes up and he says, oh, let me cut one and have you try it because they're absolutely delicious. And they tried to tell him, no, that's that's okay. You don't have to bother him. I'm, I'm buying it because it's pretty. I'm probably not going to get to eat it. <laughs> Marianne, do you have a particular place where you where you buy the fruit and other items that you use for still lifes? No, uh, whatever grocery store I have to be going to, some have better selections than others. Um, but no, and, and the fabrics too, the fabrics are a mix of my own scarves or I sometimes go to the uh, um, a fabric store and pick through the remnants and uh, do it that way. Sometimes I go to resale shops and look through the scarves there. But no, the fruit is, is pretty much what you can find. Although every so often like um, persimmons, I didn't really know what a persimmon was. I had heard of it. It's famous for a Greek mythology or something like that. But I was walking through a grocery store and I saw this lovely orange, but a soft orange. And they had a beautiful soft green leaves, four leaves at the top. And I had no idea what they were, but I said, I'm going to buy those and draw those. And I was just hoping that the checkout lady knew what they were. Marianne, someone is asking, is it possible to have too many layers of pastel? Like yes. Can they get can the layers just get too thick or heavy? It sometimes gets to the point where you have so much pastel on a surface that it won't accept more, that, that any more just knocks off dust, that's, that, that the pastel that's already there. Um, that happens more commonly if you're working on pastel paper rather than the, the sanded paper. But even the sanded paper will get to be too much especially if you grab a um, one of these, this is a schmicky, and it puts a single stroke, puts a heavy layer of pastel on there. If I did that and I decided I didn't like that, that's what I was talking about earlier, that I will use a bristle brush and I can knock it down to the 
tooth on the paper. I'm not supposed to blow, blow the pastel because it's all toxic, but I did anyway. Um, so you can knock a certain amount of the pastel dust off and that opens up the tooth for you again and gives you more layers to, uh, to work on. Right, you said that worked almost as kind of an eraser. Yes, yes. Great, thank you. I need some more colors. Some other colors. Yes, brand new pastel. That's the first thing I'm going to do right there. And uh, raw umber. That's the color I like for landscapes. It seems like a dull color, but it does a lot of good stuff. My um, still life compositions tend to not be um, a traditional way is that the landscape, the, I'm sorry, I keep saying landscape, uh, my, my still lifes are um, traditional ways to set it up like, like where it's eye level and you look forward and there's a tabletop and a um, something that simulates a horizon line. I prefer to uh, set it up so that I'm looking down or partly angled into the past, into the, the um, still life arrangement so that there is not any kind of, of horizon or tabletop. And I want to treat it all like a um, full composition uh, that doesn't reference anything like, like that. Uh, um, horizon line or or standard I'm looking down at my subject or, or looking straight at my subject and it's something I kind of just started doing because where I was working before was at, at home set up and I didn't have any way to to set it up and light it very well and also I was I really didn't know that much about what I was doing. So I just started and I just kind of like this kind of composition. I consider a lot of what I'm doing here a, a sort of push pull of the color and the values. You can see that my underpainting is pretty much covered up, but it isn't completely. There's there's still parts where you, it it will bleed through a little bit, but even if it isn't, it was a guide for the rest of the work that came afterwards. wrong one. Ariane, you talked a little bit about uh, developing your, your technique. Uh, do you have any favorite pastel artists? I have a bunch of pastel artists and I'll tell you the easiest way to say that is I am a member of the Chicago Pastel Painters and um, 
there are quite a few extraordinary artists in that group. So if you want to see pastels, especially a collection of um, the potential, the range of what can be done with pastels, watch for when they have their uh, annual or biennial show. Um, Mike, your last, your last month's artist, he's one of my favorites. Um, Nancy King Mertz is an extraordinary artist who does urban landscapes with an impressive level of detail and light. Um, I'm, I'm now drawing a blank, but there are, you know, quite a few other people. My, my studio partners, I'm a huge fan of both of their work. Jean does extraordinary portraits that have a lot of life and emotion to them. Mary Kay does just exquisitely detailed landscapes. Um, That's great. That gives us some, some names to look for. And we do have uh, past recordings of art demos by both Mike Kolosinski and uh, uh, Mertz as well. Oh, OK. Nancy did yours too. OK, yes. 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 Yes, um, Richard McKinley is an artist that's online. Uh, he does a lot of tutorials and Elaine Picard, A-L-A-I-N-P-I-C-A-R. They both do a lot of online tutorials. So if you're looking for some information and how to's, they're excellent resources also. Great ideas, thank you. I need a dark red. What do we got here? I keep saying I should wear one of those step counters when I paint because I'm always pacing back and forth between the boxes in front of the painting and stepping back. good workout. When I'm doing the fabric, especially near the end, yeah, I'm not making too much decisions now, um, but I don't necessarily um, make the final fabric and layout and the wrinkles match what was in front of me is I often use a highlight or a fold in the fabric to um, direct the eye around the painting or add something interesting to what I've got going on here. I'm gonna go over and see what I have in my yellows. Some of the best colors that I've got are in these really soft pastels, but I don't like to use them too early because they fill the tooth of the paper too much then.
one of the things I liked about this composition was the uh, the light on the lemons. And I did make a little, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, why don't you finish your thought first? As I say, I, I did make a little note to myself that compared to the uh, photograph, I wanted to move this lemon back up a little bit more than what I had taken. Right, so making adjustments to the composition. Yes. Uh, so someone is asking uh, what your experience and impressions are of oil pastels and how they might be different. Um, they, to me, are nothing like the chalk pastels. I have actually not used oil pastels as far as a finished painting. I have used something called oil crayons in um, some cold wax painting experiments. So I have pretty much no experience with doing a finished painting with, with oil pastels. I think that they don't hold the kind of brilliance and pigment that are the advantage of using chalk pastels. That's not an interesting color for that. So I'm gradually building up the, the collection of pastels that they have that I have on the tray here. One color you're not going to see me uh, um, picking up also is, as I said, I don't I don't grab black, even though it's a black cloth. I'm going to build a dark from multiple colors. I am also pretty much never going to use a white for a highlight that tends to be a flat, uninteresting color in a painting. Which I used to say like like it was absolutely a profound rule, and then I found an artist who used um, white brilliantly in her landscapes, which, as far as I was concerned, violated every rule out there, and she created a beautiful landscape. I took a, a workshop from her, and unfortunately, the name escapes me right now. So there are all kinds of rules and guidelines and laws. Learn them all and then figure out which ones you get to violate. Which makes sense for you and which doesn't. Barry, what's our time like? So remember at some point we'll want to show that slideshow and let you comment on the other images that you sent me. That, that's what I was just wondering. Do we wanna uh, do that now or? That, that would be fine, we can do that. Okay, um, switch. 
Yeah, so I'm gonna go ahead. I'll go ahead and remove the spotlight. Okay. And I will uh, go ahead and screen share the slides. Okay. So, okay, so, so I think, I on, think your on, your on your laptop, can you see uh, the screen yep. share? I can see it, and uh, this is where we are right now. <laughs> Uh, so, um, still life, red grapes and cantaloupe. This is a recent one, uh, uh, also a square composition. Um, this is another one that, for instance, that, that full open area at the bottom was dull for most of the painting, but I knew that I was going to come back in with this fun little pattern. And once I did that, I felt very comfortable with the composition and the way your eye moves through the painting. Um, go to the next one. This is a, um, there's a wetlands. Uh, I go buy it. Uh, it's not too far from my house. And uh, cold winter, foggy day and is raggedy broken tree that was just so beautiful and I loved the the shadow cast um on the water shadow and reflection and that's an interesting thing about a painting like this is that there are shadows and there are reflections in the water and you have to be kind of aware of what what they are what they're what they're both doing and uh I had a lot of fun with it now it's cold and and damp out there so I did not do a plain air painting uh, plain air being take the paintings outside take the paint outside I did a lot of photos ideally I would have sketched here but I don't think I even sketched here I think I just did a bunch of photos and worked from that one now the next one is going to be interesting because it's the same tree um, slightly different season and this is called anticipating spring because in the foreground there's green coming up in the um, I guess it's cattails, whatever the, is growing in the water there. And the light is so significantly different. I have on several occasions returned to the same spot and painted. And it's always a significantly different painting in a, in a landscape because the light changes, um, the mood changes, what you bring to the painting changes. And it's fun to do the same scene because you've gotten past the, okay, how is that tree shaped? Um, you know, where's the water, where's the land? You already kind of know that spot. So then you can move into more of being aware of the, of the light around you and uh, what's going on. Uh, oh, those are both uh, 20 by 16. They were both, uh, the technique I've done here with the uh, rubbing alcohol under painting. All right, next one. This is uh, another still life. Now this one was set up in the studio and I know I played with the um, fruit and the berries and the fabrics probably for two hours. I would arrange, I'd step back, use that viewfinder uh, again, I think I had decided I wanted to do a um, square composition, but I also wanted to get it as dynamic as possible. So I used the, the blue fabric and the black fabric to, to angle in and out of the painting, to, to divide the painting, but not in halves, just to make it a more interesting one, the, the scattered berries are also a way of leading your light around. Uh, I know that I struggled with this painting for quite a while. And what finally helped me was, was figuring out um, and changing the folds in the background and the light and folds in the foreground and the, the patterns in the blue fabric. All of that was pretty important to lead you around the, the painting. Um, and uh, well, just fun fruit, I guess. 
uh, 14 by 14 pastel. Now this one is an oil painting. Uh, um, several years ago, I got the opportunity to be an artist in residence at the Indiana Dunes. Um, at that time it was called Indiana Dunes Lakeshore. Now it is the Indiana Dunes National Park. I spent two full weeks there and every single day I went out and did plein air painting and sketching. I took hundreds of photos. Um, I worked with both pastel and oil paint while I was there. I came back with probably 15 or 20 paintings. Not all of them were finished or frame ready or anything like that. Uh, some were just studies. I had hundreds of photos and um, I did a whole body of work based on what I had done there and what I brought back with me. This was done later from uh, several photos. I usually work for more than one photo for any painting. Um, if I've got a photo that that's that it's that good that um, I just want to replicate it, I don't feel like I'm bringing anything new to it. It's kind of like just enlarge the photo and frame it. So uh, you know the same thing. Decisions are made to pull you through in and around the painting, but this in particular, I when I first started working there at the dunes, one of the things that fascinated me was the water, painting water. I hadn't done that a lot. One of the things that, the thing that challenged me the most was painting water. So I spent a lot of time literally studying the, the uh, movement and the waves and the color, making notes and making sketches. So this is a 20 by 16 oil on panel. I work on a panel surface rather than a uh, canvas for my oils. I like the uh, rigidity of it. And I like, the, these are called Richeson. They come in, are already toned. So I like that, having a color rather than, than white. And it's a very light tooth. So I use, um, for an underpainting, I'll sometimes do a add-on and wipe off technique with the oil paints. Uh, next one. Also a dunes painting. I, I took a long walk. Now the guidebook said the walk was a mile and a quarter and I don't know whose mile and a quarter that was but it was a very long walk. But it was beautiful. And um, again, I did some um, painting on site. There's sketchbook uh, paintings from here. I, I mean, my sketchbook, I usually use ink line and a little bit of watercolor to remind myself of color notes. I also make a lot of notes in a sketchbook. Um, if I think I'm gonna be painting later, I'll make notes about what I'm seeing and what interested me. Frequently, I will bring back photos that I took of a spot that I thought was absolutely marvelous, wonderful to paint. And I'll look at the photos and from if I just had the photo, I may not know what I wanted to paint or what interested me. That's why I like to do the sketchbook and um, notes if I can, if I have the opportunity. But I love that. I love the, the light on the sand here and the shadow of the trees and the light on those leaves. Uh, okay, so uh, again, th the same path. Um, the, the dunes has a hugely variable type of landscapes. It goes from oak savanna to, to the dunes we're all familiar with to of course the beaches. And um, this one walk had all kinds of scenes. Now this one, if I remember correctly, is a um, watercolor underpainting. So I like the watercolor. Uh, I do this a lot of the same things that I did with the pastel underpainting in that I am really paying attention to my values. Uh, I mapped out the darks, especially. The trees are treated as almost a solid object. I don't worry uh, too much about individual leaves or branches, rather the, the full shape something like the trees in the background are sketched in as a single object. I'm not drawing individual trees until much later. And I'm mostly drawing the trees by um, drawing around them by, by the, the sky and the sky holes that I'm putting in there. And the watercolor underpainting was very helpful in that it got a lot of that rough 
grass started for me. And I'll even use when I'm doing the watercolor, I will even use um, that fan bristle brush. I will use uh, just rough um, worn brushes. I will even use a toothbrush to uh, spray splatter onto the surface, just to add interest and texture. Sometimes it gets completely covered. Sometimes you still see through it. I think I see some of the, the, the underpainting in this. I also will sometimes use a complementary color in both techniques in, in um, pastel or the, I'm sorry, in, in the, um, when I do the pastel and alcohol underpainting or when I do the um, watercolor underpainting where the blue sky will get a yellow uh, underpainting and it, gives a little bit of lightness and sparkle when you layer that pastel on top of it. Uh, let's see what we've got from that. Okay, so I talked about doing waves. Um, I'm sure both of these were done on the second week because they are both plain air paintings and got to the point where they have seen a frame. Uh, it Again, I just spent a lot of time looking at those waves. I was fascinated by the motions, the color range, and an interesting thing that um, occurred to me about painting the waves is it's very similar to when uh, I paint the patterns on a fabric, is I'm not trying to catch something exact. I'm not trying to imitate or recreate exactly what I'm seeing. Again, I'm not making a photograph, but I'm trying to recognize a pattern. And these waves created a pattern. And as they receded, you saw the pattern diminish in size and, and importance. And a fabric will do the same thing. You create your, your, your shape and your, um, the water by looking at the patterns that's happening as, as you were sitting there. And these were both done plain air. I just sat myself in the sand and, and put a board in front of me and, uh, Got a sunburn. Uh, those are both small, 11 by eight, uh, eight in eight by 11, and they are both pastels. Usually if it's plain air, it's a little bit smaller. I, and when you do plain air, you have a window of two to three hours to catch what you want. Anything beyond that, the light has changed too much. All right, so we can look at the next one. Uh, again, dunes, now this was another studio one. And I think it was a watercolor underpainting. And this was a beautiful moment. I did this studio painting, but I did sketches and notes on site. Um, we had had a few rainy days. In this case, the rain kind of stayed off in the distance. And I was absolutely fascinated by the light that came through those clouds out there. And the, the, the form of the rain coming down, beautiful place. Uh, that is 10 by 20. Another still life, uh, pomegranate seeds. Uh, this is also an oil and uh, you can see my pattern fabric. And in fact, that fabric is actually the black fabric that I am using today. I just shifted the color. And when we're talking about pattern, the detail in that fabric is nothing like the detail that you would see if, when I, I'll show you again the, the fabric I'm working from. The fabric I'm working from is uh, a tedious level of detail that I don't need to introduce to the paintings. And I usually don't. But what I do do is I love to use that pattern and make sure it reinforces the light that comes through. So that uh, what's in here blue, what's in the other one, the black fabric, it's, it's um, semi-reflective. And I love those kind of things uh, in the still lifes. I, I just, uh, I, I consider my still life um, paintings eye candy as much as anything else. I just, I just want to um, luxuriate in form and color and light. 
Uh, I don't need to communicate anything other than, oh, this looks cool. And pomegranates are great. Funny story, I was painting uh, in, in classes um, several years ago when I was still taking a regular class. And um, I had been doing still lifes. Uh, I went to class and the teacher had set up a still life. It was Mary Kay. And she had sliced open a cantaloupe and a few other things. And it was so funny because I walked in and I went, oh, darn, I forgot they're as beautiful inside as they are outside. Up until then, it had not occurred to me to start looking at what's going on inside. And again, there's more color and depth and light here. And pomegranates are wonderful for that. Also, they're good for you. Eat them. <laughs> 10 by 10, oil and panel. Uh, Marion, there were one or two questions about uh, the the images that you sharing you're sharing with us here. Uh, one was, uh, do you, with the waves here? Did you use white um, for for these waves or other colors? No, there it's um, my palace blue, my palace yellow. Uh, the only thing I'm no, I don't even think I used it for that. Uh, I believe that this one, I actually took some of near the end of the painting. I took some of that palest blue and palest yellow uh, uh, and crumbled it into a little bit of the rubbing alcohol and made um, a, like, like almost like a liquid paint. And I used a toothbrush to spatter the, you'll see with some of the waves, that, that little bit of sparkle that's, that's shooting off. That's how I got those effects. I literally sprayed it with a toothbrush. But no, um, I doubt there's any white at all in that. Okay, great, thank you. And someone else was asking, um, when you do a watercolor underpainting uh, beneath the pastel, is it still considered a pastel then or is it considered multimedia? No, it's considered a pastel. Um, anytime that I have submitted, for instance, the uh, um, any of the pastel societies, it's the Chicago pastel painters or whatever, uh, the underpainting techniques are quite common. So what they will expect is that it has to be 80% of pastel on the, um, on the surface of the painting. But it's very frequent that um, one of the people that I mentioned for, for um, YouTube videos uh, he does the watercolor underpainting and he frequently leaves a fair amount of it showing. Okay. But no, it is still considered a pastel. All right, thank you. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, stop the screen share here. And uh, should we go back to uh, this, this phone camera? Yes. That way you can get the, let's see, mute. All right, have we got good sound and all that? Yes, sounds good. Oh, okay. So um, any questions about what's going on here? Oh, well, someone was just asking about how often you work in your studio. Are you there every day or how often? Well, I'm still kind of sort of working at my, I'm a graphic designer and I'm still kind of, kind of doing that. I am, I am inches away from from not doing that anymore or minimally. Uh, at the moment, I am here usually Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Uh, those are the days that the gallery is open too. So I like that because there's more people coming through then. I am trying to get here more often. Sometimes I'm here on uh, uh, Tuesdays and Sundays when I can. Um, uh, Wednesdays is when I teach. So, uh, I'm not here full time, but I, I would like I would like to be. I'm I'm hoping to get somewhere close to that. Get mo moving towards every day. All right. Well, we'll we'll <laughs> let you get back to painting. Thank you.
So just building up the grapes while keeping in mind which ones are a little more in shadow. I'm stepping back to figure out which way I'm going to drive the, um, the dark cloth as, as far as color. It's pretty uneven now, and it's looking kind of dull to me. In fact, enough that I might even do a demonstration of the magic eraser brush. So I'm going to get the big one. Now I'm leaning forward because the dust drops down. And if you lean forward, it drops down onto this. If you do it while it's here, it drops down across the painting. And you actually don't want that. You want it. What you should do is walk over to the garbage can and not get it on the floor, but don't tell anybody. So I'm just taking it down because this is light enough that if I kept working over it, it would it would keep dulling the layers. And you can see I shifted the um, position of that this grape here, and now I'm going to need to go back and really work on getting that out of the way too. So this is part of what I say is that some of the push pull that that I end up doing with the pastels. And I am going to get a little darker with the purples because too, if I look at what I've got going up on here, that was kind of interesting. using the side of the pastel. Oh, by the way, this is um, 400 grit new art. I've been lately working with um, 400 for the um, Still Life's landscapes. I've been grabbing the, I think it's 320 grit, something just a little coarser than this. I have some 600 and I've used that for my pastels, but I'm kind of uh, having fun with the coarser grit. I'm trying to stay looser with my work. And that is one way to, for me anyway, to do that. I have also experimented with creating my own surface. You can buy a, uh, a particular ground that you can put on a board and it creates a sanded, a tooth surface for you to work on. And I've seen that used quite effectively in uh, landscapes where you use this ground to, to create the shape and um, use the tooth to uh, define the texture of your landscape. For instance, the texture of grasses or uh, um, bushes and trees. I only had moderate success with it, but like anything else, there's, there's a bit of a learning curve. When I teach pastels, I encourage my students to have a source. Um, I feel like the best source is actually real life, whether it's 
um, something you set up in front of you or someone setting in front of you or taking it outdoors. Now, not everybody likes to do plein air painting because well, there's sometimes lovely breezes and chirping birds. Sometimes there's mosquitoes and poison ivy. Um, but I do feel like it's an important experience to have at least somewhat if you're doing landscape. At the very least, um, I expect students to use their own photos because it should be a place that they've been or experienced or familiar with. The same thing for the still life. Um, I, and, and that's easy. I mean, like I said, if you go to the grocery store, you know, get a bag of apples or cherries or whatever looks good that day or whatever is on sale, it doesn't matter. Bring it home and play with it until you've got an arrangement that looks interesting and, and draw it. Drawing something in um, that's in front of you, that's that's in the round, that's 3D, is different than drawing from a photograph because that photograph um, has made a bunch of decisions for you already, as far as uh, composition and. Uh, things like that. Um, it does also make things easier. It does flatten it. You don't have to worry. It's, it's not as hard to figure out your shape and perspective. But um, I, I do think it's a good habit to, to draw from life, if not all the time, once in a while. Or sketch, too. I do that a lot, too. I'll sketch something. To paint. Marian, could you also tell us a little bit about the uh, abstracts? For instance, the one that we can see in the background there. Oh, okay. Um, I have always done abstracts off and on. Um, I haven't necessarily shown them much because I didn't consider them a body of work and experiments, but I started doing abstracts again recently. Um, I was in the studio. I really wanted to paint. I was a lot of personal stuff going on to make it short. And I just wanted to paint but I had no plans. I, I couldn't, for instance, the still life landscapes, they, they require some planning. They require forethought and what am I gonna do, bring something in. I wasn't in that place, but a friend had just given me a canvas that she had a painting on that she didn't want anymore. She said, do you wanna reuse this? And I said, sure. So the first thing I had to do was start to cover up her painting. And, um, it's a big canvas. It's, I think it's 36 by 36, so three by three. So I set it up on the easel and the act of painting was very physical. And I just started making marks to cover up what was already there and then reacting to the mark making. And um, this is what happened. And that is the kind of approach I take to my abstracts lately is that I just start to make a mark and react to that mark. And I've learned this from a couple of other painters that I know that work opposite of what I've been doing here, you know, where I come in and I'm doing lemons and, and grapes and I know I'm doing lemons and grapes and I've done a sketch and a study. Um, it's the same thing. I've watched these artists paint intuitively and it's something that I wanted to experiment with. And uh, I switched to oils too, because it's easier for me to paint large in oils, in part because if I decide I like the painting, I can just hang it on the wall like this, where if that's a pastel, it does have to go under glass. And that is the one downside to um, painting large with pastels is it gets to be very heavy when you put that under glass. 
And if you use the museum glass, which is what I've been doing, it's a, a non-glare glass, it, it gets quite expensive. But mostly this was just a physical act, this painting. And uh, um, that's, that's, that's what I ended up with. And from there, I went to the others and I had actually had bought cold wax a few years ago and tried it and went, huh, well, that's not as easy as I thought it was and put the lid on the can and put it on the shelf. Well, the advantage to having bunches of art supplies is then when you get inspired to go back and try something, it's there on the shelf. So I started this and then I moved to two other ones that are not here, um, well, they're here down on the floor, but, um, and the, th the third one, I pulled out the cold wax and started experimenting with that because it was on a panel. And then I moved to the, the three above it. I don't think you can see it, but um, there's three above that that um, are cold wax and collage. And it's something I'm gonna be doing more experimenting with because I really um, felt good about working with, but it was all very intuitive. There was no, um, no pre-planning. And what I started with was completely different from what I ended up with, which was also interesting. Oh, fascinating, thank you. And I need another color. I'm going to scroll over here. Sometimes there's too many to choose from. No, you can never have too many pastels. Not that that was the wrong one. So the smart thing to do when, when you're painting like this, and that's the advantage they have in this, is that when I pick up, I can test it out over here. Um, I've not gotten into that habit, and I and I should. I'm going to avoid a little bit more of that. Oh, that, that wasn't the color I meant to get. Something to keep in mind when you're when you're painting something like this is that, uh, and you can even see it in in the photograph. The, see, shadows will have some of the the red from the uh, from the grapes in it. Uh, And then the grapes will sometimes have a little bit of the color on the fabric in it. You don't paint anything in a solid color. You're always bouncing around. Have a couple in your hand at the same time. That's an interesting purple. Scrolling over here to see what else we got.
So right now I'm just, as I said, I'm just trying to get the light on the fabric, kind of define a few of the shapes that may or may not last till the end of the painting. Got some strong light right in here. I just use a couple of, uh, I'm not sure what they're called, clamp, light, clamp lights. Um, and uh, they're fine for me. I actually like the fact that they're a, a warm light. I don't worry about having a, a daylight for on the subject. I don't worry about having a daylight balanced light or anything like that. This color is adding something interesting to it. A little more highlight back over here. How much time do we have left, Barry? I, I want to make sure I show the a little bit of doing the pattern making. Uh, it looks like we've got about eight more minutes. Uh, and so if you wanted to show us some of that pattern making and uh, people were also asking to maybe see the, the palette, both your working palette and the full palette of colors with all the pastels that you're choosing from, if we could take a look at that too, maybe at the end when we're ready to uh, adjust the camera. Okay, that sounds good. Yeah, because I'll have to take the camera off though. So. Yeah, exactly. So we can do that at at the end. So normally I would be a little bit further along with um, my background lights and darks before I do the um, pattern. I'm actually going to add a little bit more here. So this is nice light area. So sometimes a little 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 light finger rubbing just to just to knock back some of the roughness, especially for something like a fabric. And actually, this question ties into that. Do you ever wear gloves? No, um, I know a number of artists that do, and although this material is not hugely toxic, it is pigments that in some cases can be mildly, and of course, you can't absorb through your skin, and you know. You're supposed to observe all those safety protocols. Don't eat in the studio. Or don't drink in the studio. Wash your hands. Um, I, I, I teach that, but I don't necessarily practice it as well as I should. Uh, I'm not comfortable using gloves. I, I do wash my hands thoroughly and I have, you know, studio clothes. The one thing I try to remember is there's a tendency for um, people to lean in and want to blow the dust off of their painting. And that is a very bad thing to do because even if it wasn't toxic material, it's still a dust. And before you blow, the first thing you do is take a nice deep inhale. So uh, I try to be very disciplined about not doing that and um, you know clean up the dust when I can. But no, I, I do not wear gloves. Okay, thank you. So I am looking at those patterns and I am grabbing three colors, uh, three values. Let me grab one other one. Sometimes you end up having nothing but a stump left of your favorite color. What color you need? So what I'm looking for. So what I'm doing is I'm just I'm just grabbing three pastels that are um, three values of sort of the same color family. And let me hold that up so that you you see the. I'm trying to see where it's at here. Oh, that doesn't did that focus? There we go. 
It's pretty Okay, bright. so that's a a yellow, um, an ochre, and a slightly darker ochre orange kind of color. And I'm looking at what's going on up in up in here. Okay, now as I said, this is you know crazy detail, and there's no reason I need to duplicate that. I do want to make something that's a little bit interesting. Um, I'm going to start with the uh, mid-tone. And I'm, I'm looking at the pattern and I'm just, sort of creating what's there. I'm also, when I draw a straight line, I'm remembering that this fabric has wrinkles and I am trying to get it to travel with the shape of the fabric. The reason I grabbed multiple colors is that as this one color or line goes through the different highlights and dark of the fabric, I want to echo that. So that's not good. So over here where it's a little darker, I'll go back over that line with a slightly darker. And then what gets more interesting is that when you come over here where the light maybe hits it pretty strong, You'll see it more when I do the finished one, but that will give you an idea of what I'm doing. The big thing is, is that you're not creating these patterns with a single color. And you're using the values of what I've already got here in place to help you determine which color you're going to use. And one of my favorite parts of doing this kind of stuff is, is at the at near the end of the painting, that's when I go back through and I really find those highlights that are going to draw the viewer right through the painting, right? You know, draw the eye around because it'll follow those highlights and those details. But the big thing is, is I, you know, I don't, don't, um, Don't stress about imitating exactly what you're seeing. So this one down here. I need some more colors over here. Always, always need more colors. Different blue. Again, I'm doing this a little. A little quick and a little rough, but this will give you the idea of how it works.
I didn't look at my reference very closely here, so I'm thinking it. So if, for instance, when I have a line over here and I wanted to emphasize that this is a, I make sure that, that any shape I draw follows that edge and highlights it as it curls over the edge. Any questions on that? No, I don't think so. It's really starting to come together. It was helpful to see how you were putting in the, the pattern from the fabric there. Yeah, that's a question I, I get a lot. And like I said, this was pretty, you know, down and dirty sort of, it wasn't ready for that, but I wanted to make sure it showed that before we uh, finished up. Um, so we wanted to look at, um, yes, if you wouldn't mind, uh, using, you know, the, the, probably the phone camera to just show us again, your working palette, as well as, you know, the full palette where you were choosing colors from. This is the tray of everything that I was working with. Mm -hmm. These are the, um, Terry Ludwig's that I mostly started, that's what I mostly buy from that brand. I have a few of the others. The colors are beautiful and very saturated. And I don't have too many of those in my regular box because I don't like to use those after the initial blocking in because they're a, a different texture that I don't work with as well. It's a almost a sandy sort of texture. Okay. I'm going to unplug. Hopefully we got enough juice. Uh, and this is the full box of pastels. And you can see I have by um, hue, so yellow, red, purple, blue, green, and then some of the neutrals, blacks and whites. And um, I should, I'm sorry, black, black, white, and grays. And uh, then they're arranged by value from the the darkest to the lightest. You're, as far as I'm concerned, the, the loveliest saturated colors are right down the middle. And I, I've been caught referring to a color from the middle of the tray. Uh, so I, I keep that, you see, it, I, I keep this and I walk it over to the studio. Uh, I'm sorry, to the, to the tray. Um, these are a few, I just picked up some new Sch Schmidtke's. Now this is the brand that is real soft and very rich in buttery and you make a very rich mark with it. It also tends to fill the tooth. So I don't usually grab those until near the end of the uh, painting. And those are wonderful for my final highlights or, or look at me marks. And I, I'm gonna, since I got it, I'm gonna go back to what we were talking about with the fabric. Do you see how those lines in the background are created with several different colors? And they mimic the blue underneath them where it's dark, I've used the darker ochre, where it's light, I've used a paler yellow color. 